very, very fortunate to um, have one of the diarists uh, from Salvage Pages with us and from the documentary you just saw. Uh, also, as I mentioned earlier, 90% of the Jewish children, 14 and under, were murdered during the Holocaust. So we're very, very fortunate to have uh, Peter Feigl, who uh, has a very interesting testimony for us. And I could uh, go on and on and on about this uh, wonderful man, uh, but I think it's better for him uh, to tell us a little bit about himself. So please uh, welcome him. Thank you, and uh, you're not the fortunate ones. I am the fortunate one to have you to listen to me. So uh, I really appreciate it, especially among the teachers uh, that I hear. Uh, thank you for giving up a weekend uh, to listen to an old man. Uh, so let me first start off by saying that uh, for those of you who think that uh, I'm much too young uh, to have witnessed anything or remember anything, uh, A, I'm 83, so that's number one. Number two, uh, I wrote not one but two diaries, and uh, I started writing the first one when I was uh, 13 and a half. Thank you. So uh, whatever my mind tried to shove into the background, I've always had the diaries to fall back on. Last but not least, about five years ago, a lady in France decided to do some digging in archives and to see whether what this guy wrote in the diary really is true or not. And she came up with a treasure trove of documents, uh, which she published uh, last year in a book. And when somebody says, well, how do we know that uh, the police really did, came, uh, did come to pick him up uh, on such and such a date, she can pull up the police log and show such and such a date order to pick up Pierre Feigl at uh, 2 in the afternoon found him to be too sick to be moved, we will return, pick him up at a later date. Um, when I say that I crossed the border illegally <coughs> into Switzerland on such and such a date, she's got this arrest, arrest report showing that I was grabbed crossing <coughs> the border illegally. Uh, in fact, you saw the, my mug shot <laughs> holding a sign with my name on it that was taken by the Swiss authorities uh, when they grabbed me and there's an interrogation report, so it's, it's incredible, all the documents that are available. Let me start off a uh, Let me also tell you that I'm not going to tell you about horror stories. I was fortunate enough not to have been in a death camp. <coughs> My story essentially is do the right thing. And if it weren't for my good fortune of having run into a number of people who decided to get involved instead of standing by idly, who decided to do the right thing, I wouldn't be here. So for background, let me start off that I was born in 1929 uh, in Berlin. My father was an Austrian working in Berlin. Uh, my mother was German. Under uh, European law, a woman automatically acquires the citizenship of her husband, so she was also considered German. Uh, excuse me, uh, Austrian, <laughs> considered Austrian. And I, born in Berlin, was considered an Austrian because I automatically acquired the citizenship of my parents. My, parent, my father was a graduate mechanical engineer. Uh, he was totally integrated into German society. Uh, he uh, uh, believed very, very strongly in nothing. And uh, <laughs> uh, in fact, for tax reasons, if for no other reason, he registered himself at age 19 as an atheist uh, in order to avoid having to pay church taxes. Uh, now, you know, I have to understand that the Nazis, it wasn't a question of religion. They decided that being Jewish is a matter of race, <coughs> which I cannot accept. But anyhow, I wasn't consulted in the matter. So according to the Nuremberg Laws, which defined who is a Jew and who is not, uh, I was considered a Jew because my mother was Jewish, and that automatically made me a Jew. Now, the, in my, in the, our family was totally secular. Uh, I knew nothing about Judaism. I never set foot in the temple except once when I was five years old uh, to attend the wedding of some family member. And the only thing about the Jewish religion in our home was that around Easter time, there appeared this flat bread called matzah, and my father delighted eating it with butter and ham. <laughs> 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 that, 
that was the only thing we knew about the race. And we saw we celebrated Christmas. Uh, Christmas was not, not to, be, to celebrate the birth of Christ, but it was something we always got gifts for Christmas. I was an only child uh, and uh, went to school. I had my first school year in Berlin. Uh, I didn't look Jewish. The name Feigl, the way it is spelled, is more Austrian than a Jewish name. I didn't have any problem with my uh, the school chums in my first grade. And I did get a, uh, a first grade reader with the picture of a poisoned mushroom in front of it. And we learned that uh, the Jews are like poisoned mushrooms and they are like vermin. Uh, they uh, crawl out of the sewers, they're like rats, they spread disease. And of course, I had no desire whatsoever to identify with those kind of people. Uh, Move the clock forward, my father gets transferred uh, to uh, Prague. Uh, to close one of the company offices there. My first shock is that um, overnight I found myself in a Czech-speaking school. They didn't have bilingual education in those days. And within six months, I spoke Czech. Uh, six months later, after a year in Prague, my father gets transferred to Vienna, his hometown. Uh, his mother lives in Vienna. Uh, his youngest sister is also in Vienna. And his older sister, sister lives in Innsbruck. And uh, dad is very happy to be back in his uh, native country. But uh, my mother and uh, he had a discussion and they said, look, we're back in Austria. Uh, Austria is 95% Catholic. Uh, Catholics don't have much of, uh, don't have a great love for Jews. Uh, Hitler is ranting and raving in Germany against the Jews. Why don't we have Peter baptized? So at age eight, I was baptized. I had my first communion, and the only religious education that I had was catechism. And uh, this went, this uh, illusory life went on without any difficulty until um, uh, March of 1938. I'm now nine years old, and uh, Hitler annexes Austria at this point, and uh, without any explanation, I didn't know why. I've only found that out recently. Anyhow, we, my father and my mother decided they had to get, get out of Vienna in a big hurry. And within about seven days of the annexation of Austria, we were on a train heading for uh, Brussels, Belgium. Now, this meant that we left all of our possessions in Vienna, furniture, artwork, silverware, unit, whatever. All household things were left. We traveled with one suitcase each. Uh, my father, my mother, and I, we were taken off the train at the uh, Belgian border. Uh, the uh, uh, Nazis interrogated my father at great length. Why are you leaving uh, Germany? My father explained, I am not leaving Germany. I'm only going on vacation for a couple of weeks. And uh, as you can see, I only have one suitcase. We're going to Brussels. I have some business there and I'm taking my family along. They finally let us go. We went to, we arrived in Brussels. At this point, my parents celebrated. Belgium had declared its uh, neutrality about four or five years earlier, uh, with rumors of a potential war circulating in, in Europe. They felt, we are now safe. We are in a neutral country. We have nothing to worry about. Another shock for me, uh, not only did I leave my toys behind in Austria, I didn't have any more toys. I mean, this is important for a kid. And uh, we now moved into a furnished apartment, a very small furnished apartment. Uh, and uh, also overnight, I am now in a Belgian school where I have to learn another new language. Uh, this time, not one, but two languages, French and Flemish, which is a language akin to Dutch. And Belgium has two official languages. But again, no uh, bilingual uh, education. I managed within six months. I spoke French fluently. And uh, moved the clock forward. Come September 1, uh, September 1 1939, uh, the Nazis invade Poland. Uh, war, my parents, nothing to worry about. We're in a neutral country. What can happen here? Uh, Move the clock forward a little more. Uh, May 10, 1940, uh, the Nazis now attack Belgium, Holland, Luxembourg, and begin their major thrust against France. 
At this point, my father felt an obligation to go back to, uh, to go to work in order to uh, uh, hand out whatever salary was due to employees of his. Uh, on the way to the railway station, there's an identity check. He pulls out his passport. It's a German passport. And the Belgian authorities said, ah, we got ourselves a German paratrooper and arrest my father as a Nazi invader. <laughs> it took my mother three days to locate him. Uh, we finally went to visit him. We brought him a suitcase and a blanket. And my father said to my mother, take the kid and take your mother, or my grandmother, who also lived in Brussels, and get the hell out of here as fast as you can. <coughs> you don't want to get caught between two armies. You've got the Nazis that are coming in from the northeast, and you have the French and the Brits trying to <coughs> bolster or support the Belgians coming in from the southwest. You don't want to get caught between the two. We start off uh, on the, uh, together with hundreds of thousands of other refugees who left, went to the uh, coast, Channel Coast first, and uh, on the way we were being machine gunned by dive bombers, German Stukas. They weren't after the refugees, but they were trying to block the roads to prevent French and British troops to move towards uh, the, against, the, against the Germans, so they were trying to block that. This is 1940. Uh, I'm 11 years old. Just before the war started, my mother had taken me to the movies to see an American film called Test Pilot with a famous American movie <coughs> actor. Most of you young kids never heard of him, Clark Gable. <laughs> and uh, I said to my mother, when I grew up, I want to be a pilot. I think it's cool, silk scarf, leather helmet, <laughs> leather jacket. Uh, Wow, and goggles, I want to be a pilot. So while we were being machine gunned, and every time when they attacked us, they came just about every 20 minutes like clockwork, everybody would dive into the ditch along the road. I could only think of one thing. When I grow up, I'm going to sit in the cockpit of that airplane. And <laughs> <laughs> a lot of fun, okay? Well, that's the way an 11 year old thinks. So, <coughs> we ultimately make it uh, to Paris, where my mother's sister lived. Uh, we are in Paris for no more than about an hour when there's an air raid and my mother says, let's get out of here. I'm not, I didn't come to Paris to get bombed. We, grab, we get on a train with my grandmother. We go to Bordeaux in the south of France on the Atlantic coast. And at this point, my mother's background, her culture, her education uh, snaps into place. As a good German, we must go to the police and register. <gasps> so mother goes to the French police. And in Europe, in those days, if you moved into a town, you first had to go to the police, register, and get permission to stay in the town. And without such a permission, you couldn't apply for trying to rent a room or anything else. The French policeman scratches his head and says, he says, well, you, madame, you're born in Germany, and you marry an Austrian that makes you an Austrian, but there's no more Austria. And uh, you come from Belgium, and you're accompanied by your mother and by your son, but you don't have a visa and you have no permission to be here, I don't know what the hell to do with you. <laughs> Go to the gendarmerie. Well, that's gendarmerie, sort of the national police. Same thing over there. I don't know what to do with you. Why don't you go to the prefecture, which is sort of the uh, departmental administration, uh, like a county uh, administration. And there she finds someone and says, ah, madam, we know exactly what to do with you. You're going to get on a train and you're going to go to a place called Oloron Saint Marie, which is in the Pyrenees Mountains near the, uh, near the Spanish border. And we have experts who know exactly how to do, deal with cases such as yours. So, mother, with the little money she has left, takes a train with her mother and me. We arrive in Oloron Saint Marie. This train is surrounded by French gendarmes with submachine guns. They take us off the train, load us onto trucks, and 20 minutes later, they dump us into a French concentration camp. Now, this is not a death camp. Uh, France had a number of concentration camps that were set up uh, in the late 1930s, primarily to uh, house illegal immigrants that came from the, that were fleeing the Spanish Civil War. So the Jews camp had about uh, 60 barracks. Every barrack, uh, wooden barrack, uh, held about 60 people. Uh, you had no cots or bed, you slept on the floor. Uh, once a week, fresh straw, straw was strewn on the floor. 
Uh, there were no washing facilities or toilet facilities within the barracks. If you wanted to wash your hands or any other part of your body, you had to go there with a cold water spigot out in, in the courtyard outside. The camp was surrounded by barbed wire. Uh, food was next to non-existent. Uh, we received for breakfast a lukewarm, dark fluid, which the French called coffee. And you received a slice of bread. And uh, that was about 200 grams. That's about, uh, what, about eight, eight ounces of bread. And uh, at lunchtime, you received another li uh, lu lukewarm liquid. Uh, if you found a carrot slice floating in it, you were very lucky. You had something to chew on. Uh, and you got another slice of bread. And the same thing happened again at dinner time. Uh, disease was rampant. Uh, this is now uh, late Ju May, uh, early June, 1940, in the south of France. France is famous for its perfumes. That ain't the place where it was made. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, my mother had been a, a, a phys ed teacher. She was physically strong, tall, spoke French fluently, and as a uh, so she was made a barracks chief. And barracks chiefs would get periodic briefings. Uh, from the uh, uh, camp guards or the, the, the uh, uh, camp commander to learn what was going on on the outside. You have to understand we were totally cut off from the rest of the world. We didn't know what was happening on the outside. We only got rumors brought in by the next batch of prisoners who were brought into the camp. And it was very difficult to know what really is going on. There was no radio, no television, no newspaper, or anything like that. Uh, June the 22nd, France collapses after six weeks of trying to resist, resist but not too, too strongly, the Nazi invasion. France is divided into two, into a northern occupied zone and a southern so-called free zone. Uh, the so-called Vichy government takes over. Mother learns that about four or five days later, a German army inspection team, Wehrmacht team, was coming to the camp. She says the Wehrmacht doesn't have blacklists. They're not looking for Jews. And by the way, the French had locked us up because we were considered enemy aliens. So at that point, we were not arrested for being Jewish, but for being enemy aliens. And there were in the camp a number of non-Jewish Germans who were also in the camp. Mother says, we're getting out of here. She goes to the entrance of the camp. As soon as she sees the head of the German Army Commission coming in, she rushes forward with her passport in her hand, yells as loud as she can, Heil Hitler, I am a citizen of the German Reich. I demand to be released instantly from this stinking hellhole where these naughty, dirty Frenchmen have kept me, my mother, and my son for the last six weeks. The German officer is stunned, looks at her passport, says to the camp commander, you call taxi for madame. You pay taxi. The taxi takes madame wherever she wants to go. <laughs> 20 minutes later, we're out of there. <laughs> the cab driver, where to madame? <coughs> My mother, take us to Spain. That is <laughs> impossible. The French won't let anybody out, and the Spaniards won't let anybody in. So where can you take me? I can take you north. Start driving. We head north. <coughs> At this point, somehow, and I don't know why or I don't know quite how, my grandmother found out that her other uh, daughter, the one who was in Paris, my aunt, had made it to Toulouse. And the cabbie takes us through Toulouse. My grandmother says to my mother, you've got enough on your hands just handling the kid. You don't need, need me on board. She bails out and joins her other uh, daughter. We continue northward uh, for a while. We come to a town called Osh, and there are people coming towards us and say, don't go into the town, the, or, or rather beyond here, the Nazis are on the other side of the town. So we get out of the cab, and at this point, uh, mother sees a large uh, red brick building. She rings the doorbell. It turns out to be a convent. She explains her situation, and the uh, nun says, come in, we will take care of you. So this is the first time that we run into someone who says, we will take care of you. Please, don't worry, we will help you. The nuns put my mother in touch with a food distribution center in the town of Osh. 
Uh, it is operated jointly by the Swiss Red Cross and uh, American Quakers. It has nothing to do with Quaker Oats. Uh, uh, but um, the Quakers have done, in my estimation, uh, so much good. It's totally disproportionate to their numbers. There are only about 300,000 Quakers worldwide. Um, but they decide that they will give my mother a part-time job. Uh, the food distribution center originally, again, had been set up about two years earlier in order to help Spanish refugees. Uh, with a uh, part-time job, my mother can go to the police and register in Osh, and she gets a permission to, uh, for us to settle in Osh. We find a one-room, and I mean one-room apartment, very small room, which is bathroom, bedroom, uh, living room, kitchen, everything. Uh, but at least we are relatively safe at this point. Uh, sh shortly thereafter, the Vichy government uh, um, publishes laws defining who was a Jew, uh, laws that were even more rigid than the Nuremberg laws that the Germans had uh, published. Uh, under the French laws, even if you have a if you have a great grandmother that is Jewish, that automatically makes you Jewish. The German only went as far as a grandmother. So, uh, my mu, she's looking for my father. She ultimately finds that my father is also in Gus, the same camp we had been in, but he arrived there later. My father was about 16 years older than my mother. It was customary back in those days that in a well-to-do family, a young man wouldn't even consider getting married until such time as he was established in business, had a solid income, and was financially able uh, to support a wife. So there was a <coughs> age difference. Uh, in the camp, my father had gotten very sick. He developed heart troubles. Uh, finally, in March of 1941, uh, at the, the camp commander came to the conclusion that he doesn't have much longer to live, so let the man croak outside the camp. It'll save us the cost of burying him. And he gets a 30-day uh, convalescence leave and is able to join us in Osh. Uh, I am going to school in, uh, in Osh. I have no problem. This is 41. I am 12 years old. Move forward, 1942. I am 13. At this point, rumors are circulating in the late spring, early summer, that Jews are being rounded up in Paris. Uh, people don't quite know why or what is going on. The rumors say that they're being, quote, resettled eastward. Uh, whenever I enter the room and my parents are talking about it, they immediately climb up, undoubtedly to protect me. And in, uh, on the 14th of July, the end of the French school year, I am fortunate enough to be sent to a Quaker-operated summer camp some 35 miles away from Osh, uh, into a, in a town called Condon. Uh, if I spell out the name for you and you read it, you would say Condom. Uh, <laughs> but anyhow, that's the name of the town, and today they're very proud they have actually have a condom museum there. <laughs> <laughs> anyhow, I went up in Condom. Uh, the lady in charge of the summer camp is a very devout Catholic lady, Mrs. Madame Cavaillon. She takes me under her wing. Uh, I'm a nice, good-looking uh, boy, uh, 13 years old. She takes me to Mass, 7 o'clock Mass every morning. Uh, sometimes I serve Mass, uh, and uh, everything is fine. Until uh, the middle of August, all of a sudden my father appears, riding a bicycle. Now, mind you, I said he had heart, he had heart trouble. He drove, he rode 35 miles on his bicycle on a hot summer day uh, to come and visit me unannounced and he hands me a small pouch and I go to look into it. He said, no, don't look into it. Just put it in your pocket, uh, keep it. And um, he says, unfortunately, I don't have any, uh, enough time. I can't stay with you. I just wanted to see you and give this to you. Uh, under the Vichy laws, Jews are not allowed to be on the street after dark. So I must get back to Arsh before dark. And he climbs back on his bicycle. And we were on the crest of a hill. And as he goes down the hill and disappears from my view, I was certainly over overcome with the horrible feeling that I, I probably will never see him again. And uh, needless to say, as soon as he had disappeared, I had to open up the pouch. And I look inside. 
and I find that it contained a bracelet of my mother's, a couple of rings that belonged to her. It uh, contained my father's golden pocket watch, a small amount of money, and that only reinforced the apprehension that I had suddenly, the realization that they must be expecting something terrible uh, to part with these items. Uh, there's nothing I can do about it. A few days later, on the 27th of August, 1942, Madame Cavaillon calls me into her office and tells me I have some sad news to tell you. I've just learned that your parents were arrested in Osh yesterday. Uh, but do not worry, I'm going to organize a novena. And for those of you who are not Catholics, that's nine days of the rosary. And she says at the end of the novena, your parents will be restored to you. So just don't get too upset about it. We will take care of you. Uh, three days later, uh, Madame Cavillon comes into the breakfast room and says, you look very sick, you must go to bed immediately. I said, I'm feeling perfectly fine. Don't argue with me, go to bed right now, you are sick. <laughs> and she gives me some medication that I'm supposed to take. And shortly thereafter, two French gendarmes arrive, and they take my temperature, and they say, we, oui, Madame Cavaillon, the boy is sick, he's running a fever, but we will be back. Madame Cavaillon sends a letter to the Quakers. I said, please, I have a Jewish boy on my hands. Jewish as defined by Gishi laws. You've got to take him off my hands because I don't know how much longer I can protect him. The uh, gendarmes have been here and they said they're going to come back. Uh, two days later, three days later, she gets a letter from the Quakers. Uh, you're very lucky. We've just received permission from the Vichy government to organize a uh, children's transport. 500 children uh, will be allowed to leave France and will be allowed into the United States. Uh, the uh, children's convoy will leave sometime in the latter part of November, around the 26th or the 27th of November from Marseille on the Mediterranean. So please have Peter or Pierre, as I was uh, called then, have Pierre fill out this form. And I fill out the form. And by the way, I've got a copy of the form. I found this lady in France found it in the archives. Uh, on the form, name, father's name, mother's name, birth date, and so forth, religion. Catholic. Uh, three days later, Madame Cavaillon gets a letter from the Quakers. Madame Cavaillon, don't you understand? We are trying to save some Jewish children, not Catholics. We cannot help you. Madame Cavaillon writes a four-page letter back to the Quakers, of which I have a copy, and says, says to them, how ironic. You will not take the kid because he says that he is a, a Catholic. And when the gendarmes come and I show them his baptismal certificate, they say to me, it's garbage. It's worthless. Under French law, this kid is a Jew. Please reconsider. The Quakers reconsider, and they decide, OK, we will incorporate him in this convoy. Uh, meantime, the gendarmes come again. Uh, meantime, also, uh, I receive one postcard from my parents from a camp called Le Vernet. Uh, for those of you who saw the exhibit uh, earlier this afternoon, uh, there was a panel showing several of the French concentration camp. Le Vernet was one of them. It's a transit camp. And then a few days, three, four days later, there was another message from my parents uh, saying that they were leaving Drancy, which is a suburb of Paris. And that, as we learned many years later, uh, was the final assembly point from which the convoys uh, left France for Auschwitz. Um, of course, at the time, I didn't know about Auschwitz, but uh, anyhow, uh, then uh, no more news from my parents. I didn't know what happened. Uh, two more times, the gendarmes came to pick me up. Each time, again, I was made sick. And here, it's uh, important to point out that Madame Cavaillon was now being tipped off, which means that somebody in the gendarmerie, a policeman, made a very, very difficult decision, and that is he didn't just put his job on the line, but he knew that he was putting his life on the line. It was a, it was a crime to aid any Jew to hide him, to help him escape, or what have you, and was punishable by death. On, that, on top of that, uh, he was at risk of having his property confiscated from him. His children could have been taken away from him for re-education. So it takes a brave man to decide to stick his neck out and help someone 
along those lines. Uh, on the 6th of November, Madame Cavaillon takes me to Marseille. She decides to take a four-year-old uh, curly-haired blonde, a little girl mentioned in my diary, uh, took her along, which is also a courageous act on her part, but she figured that if I had my four blonde little four-year-old girl and this 14-year-old uh, boy, uh, excuse me, 13-year-old kid with me, uh, I'm less likely to be stopped by the police for an identity check or what have you. She takes me to Marseille, turns me over to the uh, Quaker office in Marseille, <coughs> says goodbye to me, and uh, I am told just wait, in the next few days we will put you on the ship and you will be on your way to the United States. On the 10th of November, the Allies, consisting at that time, uh, in that theater of, of the war, of the British and the Americans, decided, without consulting me, I might add, to land in North Africa. And the moment they landed in North Africa, the Nazis now had a pretext for occupying the so-called free zone of France, and they were occupying the free zone in order to protect them, to protect the French from these invaders who are across the Mediterranean in North Africa. In my diary, my entry is goodbye America. I thought that this was curtains for me. I'm now being bounced from one uh, orphanage to another, <coughs> primarily orphanages uh, full of Spanish kids, again from the Spanish Civil War. Uh, there isn't much food across the street. I see a German SS Panzer Division armored division uh, a unit moving into a farm that's across the street from there. And I see that they eat very well, and I go over there. This is 1942, yeah, I'm 13, 13 and a half. And I just start talking them up, talking to them. They're German, oh, wonderful, have some chocolate. Join us, have some spaghetti. Would you like some dinner? I was eating, <laughs> was very happy with them. And one of them says to me, What's a young boy, what's a nice German boy doing here in the south of France? And I had to think very quickly. And I don't know how or why, maybe I learned from my mother, bluff, I said, shh, my father is in the Gestapo, but don't tell anybody. We were assigned, he was assigned to France before the war because we speak French fluently. And I go to school and I listen to what my schoolmates have to tell and I reported to my father, and it helped him in his job. I said, oh, you're a wonderful boy. That's what we need. <laughs> Unfortunately, the uh, director of the orphanage saw me talking to the German, and as soon as I got back, he grabbed me by the neck and said, are you crazy? And I'm shipping you butt out of here. And please don't sh ship me out. Shut up. You're going. <laughs> so I was out of there. A few days, that's also described in my diary. A few days later, he came to this other orphanage and I begged and pleaded with him. He decided to take me back. Anyhow, uh, in uh, early January of 1943, uh, news, uh, rumors are beginning to circulate in Marseille that the Nazis were about to round up the Jews in the Marseille area. And uh, I am told, pack your little bag and get to uh, st stand by, be ready to move on a moment's notice. Uh, we have to get you out of here. And uh, in early uh, January, I'm put on a train. I'm told where to go, when to get off the train. I arrive at uh, one, one o'clock in the morning, I think, in a uh, godforsaken place called Le Chambon sur Lignon, a small village on a, uh, a mountain plateau an elevation of about uh, uh, 3,000 feet. It's bitter cold. Uh, there's a man there to meet me. His name is Daniel Tokme. As I was to find out later on, he is the uh, cousin of the um, uh, pastor of the village of Le, Tonc, uh, of Le Chambon. And this is a most unusual village. Uh, you heard earlier mention of uh, uh, Pierre Serrano. That was for the teachers, the teachers who were in the class uh, <coughs> and heard John um, Roth. Roth, John Roth. He mentioned Pierre Sauvage, uh, who produced the documentary uh, Weapons of the Spirit. It's all about the village of Le Chambon. 
a village of about 5,000 inhabitants <coughs> that saved over 3,500 Jews, mostly Jews. Uh, why? Well, in Catholic France, uh, France also is about 90, 95% Catholic, or it was then, and uh, in Le Chambon, the population was about 95% Protestant. Many of the Protestants in Le Chambon were uh, uh, Christian fundamentalists. Uh, they believed very strongly in what the Bible said to them. Uh, they contained the Word of God. And in the film, there's a very touching scene. An elderly lady is shuffling towards what they call their temple, and she's clutching a book in, her, in the crook, crook of her hand. And uh, the Pierre Sauvage, the producer, says, tell me, madame, why did you do this? You were, uh, you were risking your own lives. You were uh, sharing food with these people. Uh, what made you do this? And she said, it's the right thing to do. It says so in the book. The book says that if someone is sick, you go to their bedside and you try to bring them cheer. If someone is hungry, you ask them to sit at the table with you and share what is on your table. If someone needs shelter, you open your door and you ask them to come in. So it's in this spirit that these people are lived. Uh, interestingly here, I need to explain, and this is especially for younger people, uh, if you've never been in, in a French or European small village, uh, you have to understand what life is like there. These are, these are farming communities. In the United States, your nearest uh, neighbor on a farm, uh, maybe a half a mile down the road, if you're in Texas, he's probably 20 miles down the road from you. Um, but in France, they learned in the Middle Ages that in order to protect themselves from marauding bands and so forth, the villages had to cluster into tightly knit villages with the houses adjoining one another, not just adjacent, but they're adjoining. Uh, the streets were purposely kept very narrow to prevent <coughs> marauders from riding through or with, coming through with cars. So the width of a street was about from where I am standing to this row, the first row here uh, in the theater. And when someone looked out his window and saw the light go out across the street, ah, it's 8.15. Well, how do you know that? Well, the lights always go out at 8.15 across the street, and in 17 seconds, the lights will come on on the second floor. That's the time it takes them to get up to the second floor, <laughs> and you now knew that you had six and a half minutes until the lights go out. That's the time it took them to get undressed, brush their teeth, put on their nightcap, their nightgown, climb and say their prayers, climb into bed, and turn off the lights. And this was a routine that went on all the time. But in those days, Lights came on in rooms that were never lit before. Lights went out. But no neighbor ever asked his neighbor across the street, who's staying with you? I've seen, I see you have lights going on there on the, on the second floor. No. As some people later said, it was a conspiracy of goodness. That's what these people conducted. And miraculously, or for whatever reason, the only person who was ever arrested during that period when these good souls were saving 3,500 Jews was one individual, it was Daniel Tokme, the one who met me at the railway station. He was arrested because the Nazis couldn't believe that a non-Jew would go to the trouble of hiding and protecting some 24 Jewish boys and girls that were in the uh, uh, house where I was uh, housed at the time. He was uh, taken to Mauthausen and he was ultimately uh, executed by firing squad. Um, so, uh, I'm going to, excuse me, wet my whistle. <laughs> Give me a minute, okay? Thank you. <coughs> Now, uh, again, in order to help even more people, the uh, villages in the Chambon organized an underground network. They were manufacturing false identity papers. And uh, I was one of those that I was selected. I was given a false identity. I'd be, instead of being Pierre Feigl, I became Pierre Plasson, a nice French name. Uh, my place of birth was changed from Berlin to Arsch. And uh, my birth date was kept the same. 
and I was told the reason we do that is that if someone suddenly says, what's your birthday? Uh, you don't start stammering, ah, 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 no. <coughs> something that you instinctively respond to. And I was shipped off with four other fellows from the, uh, from the Chambon uh, into a French high school in a, a village called Fijac. And um, of course, there, there were no school buses, so if you went to a high school or to, to, to any school in France, and you, your parents were not able to pick you up or you weren't able to walk uh, home in the evening, you became a boarding student. So you lived in the school, uh, you slept there, you ate there and so forth, you did your homework, and if you were lucky, maybe your parents were able to come and pick you up on the weekend, you could spend the weekend with them. If you were an orphan or if they lived too far away and couldn't get there, the only time you would be able to see your parents would be at uh, Christmas time, during Christmas vacation time or Easter time, so or just during the summer. So uh, I'm now in Pijak, and I should run back for a second. My first diary ends in January, shortly after I arrived in Le Chambon. The reason it was confiscated from me when uh, Daniel Trocme saw that I was writing in my diary. He looked at it, and it contained too many names, addresses, and states. And they said, if this falls into the hands of the, either the French police or the Nazis, uh, it's curtains for a lot of people. That's why it disappeared from me. January the 1st, 1944. I'm now uh, 15. Uh, I start my second diary and uh, move the clock forward to come up to May of 1944. Uh, and uh, one fine morning, the, um, uh, an SS division called Das Reich uh, rolls into the town of Fijac and orders all the males between the ages of 16 and uh, 54 to report uh, to the town square uh, for hard labor. Well, at this, at this stage, I'm a little smarter than I was before, and I said, well, I'm not 16 yet, I'm only 15 and a half, but I think it'd be a good idea if I just lay low and disappear for a while. And I was still, there was a, a Catholic church, it was adjoining the schoolyard. I knew my way into it. I had served, uh, I had been an altar boy in there. I climbed up into the church steeple and hid for the next 24 hours. There was a great observation post for me. I could see the town square off in the distance. And 24 hours later, when the trucks with all the males left town, I decided to come back down. At this point, uh, some members of a Jewish underground organization, resistance group, um, got a hold of me and said, you've got to get out of here, you can't stay. Uh, we're going to help you be ready to leave at a moment's notice again. And uh, shortly thereafter, I think it was the 22nd of May, uh, about two weeks before the Normandy landings, I was uh, told to take a train to get out, to get off at the town of Viry. And uh, uh, there would be passeurs, nowadays it would be called coyotes, uh, people who help you illegally across the border against the payment, and they will show you where to cross, when to cross, and so on. You saw some of that simulated here in uh, the uh, movie you just saw a little while ago. And uh, at, the, at a given sign, I jumped across the barbed wire the fence, climbed over it, uh, ran across the no man's land, over the Swiss border of a fence, and pr was promptly arrested by a Swiss guard and uh, turned over to the Swiss authorities and at that time, Switzerland was sending the Jews right back to France, right back into the hands of the uh, German occupation forces. But fortunately, someone had sewn into the lining of my jacket my baptismal certificate. And when I pulled it out of my jacket and showed it to them, they said, ah, mais vous êtes catholique, bienvenue en Suisse, you are a Catholic, welcome to Switzerland. <laughs> Now, on top of that, my father had given me the name of a business associate of his in Bern, the Swiss capital. And I gave that name to the authorities. They contacted their family, and they were kind enough to take me in. Now, uh, for me, at that point, the war was over. I was safe in a, in a neutral country that stayed neutral until the end of the war. Uh, I ultimately... I uh, learned that my parents had been sent to Auschwitz. I didn't have any documentation or any proof of that until 19, uh, excuse me, until uh, 2002, uh, 
no, correction, uh, 1990, uh, 1993. That's when the state of Florida mandated the teaching of the Holocaust. And uh, our local newspaper uh, organized a um, workshop for uh, teachers and they dug me up together with three other uh, Holocaust survivors and we were to tell the teachers about our experience. Uh, from the questions I got from the teachers, I realized that they knew absolutely nothing about the, about the situation. And um, anyhow, uh, this uh, one of the survivors was a, a French boy. Well, at the time, there was a boy. He's now as old as I am. And uh, his mother and his two sisters were arrested in Paris while he was in school. Uh, all three of them were sent to Auschwitz. He survived. And he said to me, "Are you familiar with the uh, memorial of the, uh, the mo memorial uh, of the Jews deported from France?" And I said, "No." And he brought out a book about this thick. Uh, it contains a list of some 75 convoys which left Paris uh, for Auschwitz. Each convoy had about 1,000 people, give or take two or three people, uh, listed all in alphabetical order. And since I knew the date when my parents were arrested, I leafed through there, looked, started looking after that date, and sure enough, I soon found that my parents were on convoy number 28 and left Paris on September the 4th and arrived in Auschwitz on September the 6th. Uh, the bureaucracy that managed, operated, controlled the Holocaust is mind-boggling. Uh, there are records kept of everything. And they, there is a head count of how many were found dead on the train when they arrived, how many were immediately sent to the gas chamber, and how many of them were put into slave labor. Who were given, they, they had numbers tattooed on them, and they were essentially worked to death. Um, you young people look at a, a list in alphabetical order, a thousand names, big F deal. Okay, <coughs> you sit down at the keyboard and you start punching in names in any order. And when you're done, oh, and if you make a mistake, you can say delete or insert, uh, a highlight. Uh, you got the idea? Back then, it didn't work that way. And when you're done here, you just press one key, sort, A to Z, Z to A by first name, last name. Very easy. And then hit print. Didn't work there. In those days, they had something called typewriters. And if you want to make a list in alphabetical order, a thousand names, you needed a thousand cards. And you now had to sort the thousand cards. Start letter, first letter M, letter R, letter A, L, and so forth. You wind up with 26 stacks. You sort each stack and put them in alphabetical order. All the A's, the B's, and so forth. Now you've got a thousand cards. And now you sit down at a piece of equipment called a typewriter. And every time you get to the end of the line, you have to push the carriage back to the other end, and it went bing, and then you started <laughs> typing again. And you use something called carbon paper. You've never heard of carbon paper, right? If you made a typographical error, if you had to correct something using uh, carbon paper, it was a pain in the neck to correct it. It was very time consuming. So it's just mind boggling. Uh, I mentioned, I think, earlier, there's a lady in France about four or five years ago who went through French uh, and Swiss archives to find out, did Pierre Feigl really dream all of this stuff, or is it true? And she was able to dig up uh, documents, official documents, uh, newspaper articles, and so forth, uh, bolstering anything, that, everything that's in my, in my uh, diary. And, uh, for instance, she found Phone intercepts. Again, you guys think phone intercept, big deal. You program your computer that when that phone number comes on, automatically the recorder goes on. Okay? And you record where the call comes from and where the call goes to. You didn't have those like that. You had, you had a, a switchboard, a board with lots of holes. And when the light came on, somebody was picking up the receiver at, uh, on that line. You took a cord and you plugged it in and you had to put on earphones, and you had to sit there and listen to everything that was being said and write it down quickly, because there was no recording machine. And then you had to go and type the stuff up. This is just to give you a small idea of how thorough and how much manpower went into organizing 
this Holocaust, this mass murder. And anybody who says to you that uh, it didn't happen, boy, they really documented it and it's available, it's, it's there. So, uh, what am I, when I speak to a school, I say to the students, you might ask yourself, what relevance does this have with your life? <coughs> to me. My answer to that is the following. You're not born with hatred in your heart. Hatred is something that is taught. Some of it is taught to you subconsciously. If your parents happen to dislike one type of people or one group of people because of their nationality or the color of their skin or, whatever, or their religion or whatever it is, you're going to pick some of this up by osmosis and it becomes part and parcel of you. You learned it and your parents obviously must be right because you're only a little kid. What the hell do you know about this? You listen to your parents. Other things are taught to you from your schoolmates or you learn it in school and uh, this thing mushroom, mushrooms, it grows on you. And what happens is nowadays the best manifestation of the first manifestation in schools, there isn't anybody in this classroom who has not either been bullied or has seen somebody getting bullied or uh, was the actual bully. And I'm saying to you that the next time you see it happen, get involved. You've got to do something about it. You have to stop it. And there are two good reasons for stopping it. The very first one, and I think the one that should guide, guide your motivation, is because it is right. It is the right thing to do. It is the ethical thing. It is the moral thing to do. And if that isn't enough, then just be a selfish so-and-so and say, hey, if I don't get involved, who knows, the next time around, I may be on the receiving end of it because I'm a redhead or I have freckles or I'm overweight or underweight or I wear the wrong clothes or whatever the damn thing is. But at some time or another, somebody's going to put you into some minority group and you may be the target. And that is why you need to get involved and that's why you need to stop it. I've almost said everything I wanted to say to you. I want to thank you for listening to me, and I want to open it up to a question that you might have. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. myself, didn't I have another diary? I mean, the first, the second one I carried in my backpack when I went across the border into Switzerland. And it reached a point where I thought, I must have dreamt it. Well, through a series of really weird circumstances, I uh, wound up in a movie called Weapons of the Spirit, made by a Hollywood film producer, Pierre Sauvage. Uh, and the Weapons of the Spirit is named for the words that the pastor of Le Chambon uttered uh, on the day that uh, France collapsed, he addressed his congregation and said to them, now is the time to fight the enemy with the weapons of the spirit. He was a pacifist, but his parishioners understood what he meant by that. Anyhow, I appear in this movie, I have a brief uh, scene in which I'm being driven from the town of Le Chambon from the village up to the house where I was hidden at the time. And uh, the film was shown in France in 1987. Shortly after it was shown there, I received a letter from a man in Paris. Are you the, the one, the Pierre Feigl, who wrote a uh, diary dedicated to his parents? I smelled or suspected the scam. I wrote back to the man, send me a photocopy of at least one page so I can see whether that's mine or not. Sure enough, it was my diary. At that time, I was crossing the Atlantic on business just about every five weeks or so. My next trip, I stopped in Paris and went to see the man, sure enough, my diary. Where did you find this? How did you get it? I bought it on the flea market in the south of France, along either in Cannes or Nice, sometime around 1949, 48, 49, three, four years after the war. 
I'm a collector of such memorabilia, and I published your diary in France in 1976. <laughs> May I have my diary back? <laughs> it's going to cost you. And to this day, it grates me, but I had to pay the SOB $265 to get my diary. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Were you able to retain any of the things your father gave you? Good question. Uh, I uh, am ashamed to admit that once I was in Switzerland, uh, I, this is 44 and 15 and a half, uh, I discovered that in Switzerland at 15 you can go to a nightclub. Now I love to dance. So I, but to go to a nightclub, you have to pay admission. And uh, in those days, if you took a girl out, you picked up her tab. She wasn't picking up your tab. I find nowadays the girls are picking up the tab. <laughs> <laughs> but back then was that word. So I foolishly sold some of, most of the items. Uh, I do have some of them left. I had, I had my father's good luck charm that was on his uh, uh, car key chain. I still have that. I have a small uh, spark plug of his that, uh, that I have. But unfortunately, most of the other items I sold. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Did you ever get a chance to reunite with the people who helped you along the way? Uh, another good question. Did I ever have a chance to reunite with the people? <clears throat> I've gone back to Le Chambon on a number of occasions. Uh, I really didn't find anybody in Le Chambon that, uh, that knew me uh, or that I knew. And many of them already had died. Uh, but. Uh, I especially looked for Madame Cavaillon, uh, the lady who ran the uh, home where I was when they came to arrest me. Uh, in 1994, I spent about two weeks in the area of Marseille, uh, calling everybody in the telephone book named Cavaillon. <laughs> no, couldn't find her. Again, through a fluke, uh, in 1992, uh, I was asked to go and speak in the town of Osh in the public library. Uh, they, were, they had readings from my diary, and uh, in the, at the end of my uh, of the reading and uh, the Q and A uh, session, a lady comes up to me and she said, "I think I know Mrs. Carillon's son." How? Where? What? Well, he's a priest in Marseille. And so she gave me the name, I called him up, sure enough. <coughs> what happened was that after the war, Mrs. Cavillon married or remarried, and obviously took the name of her new husband. The husband adopted the two children from the previous marriage, so their name also disappeared. So it was really a fluke that I rediscovered them. I invited the priest and his sister, the little girl, the little blonde girl that was four years old. I invited both of them. They spent a week with us, uh, with my wife and I, in Florida. And I forgot to mention, I came to the United States in 1946. Uh, at the time, I was uh, 17 and a half. Uh, in 19, I spent three years in the U.S. Air Force. Uh, that really allowed me to. Uh, catch up on my screwed up education with all the moves and so forth in France. Uh, I really lost a lot, lot education-wise. Uh, in 1953, uh, in September, I met a young lady uh, at a party and uh, that was organized specifically for the purpose of my meeting her. <laughs> I took an instant dislike to her. <laughs> she took an instant dislike to me. She thought I was a Nazi. I thought that she was a communist. <laughs> I had nothing to do with her. Four months later, we got married. <laughs> and here I am, 58 years later. I'm still with the same wife. Uh, we had have, we have two daughters. Uh, one of them has two uh, young boys, our grandsons. One of them is, is in his second year at Penn State, and the other one is in his uh, sophomore year in uh, uh, high school. So, and I must say that even though my teen years and my youth were pretty well much screwed up, uh, I was blessed with a very, very nice uh, career, work-wise. Uh, I did become a pilot. I did get into the aircraft industry. Uh, I traveled at company expense to some 76 countries in the world, wow. and uh, always staying in the most expensive and best hotels. <laughs> uh, 
hosting dinners in the best and most expensive restaurants in town. So uh, life has been very kind to me. Yes, sir. Uh, so how many languages do you speak fluently? Well, I speak French uh, and German. When I speak French, people say, are oh, you a Parisian, although I never lived in Paris. When I speak German, people immediately say, are oh, you a Berliner? Uh, when I speak English, people say, hmm, you have some sort of an accent, I can't quite trace it. Uh, but, uh, uh, and I think I, I manage English fairly well at this point. And when I speak Spanish, I say four words in Spanish, and people say to me, ah, usted es alemán. You're a German. So, uh, I don't know why that is, but somehow when I speak Spanish, lousy Spanish, it comes across. Uh, I understand Dutch, I understand Flemish. Uh, if you speak French fluently, and I also had two years of Latin, of course, in, in school in France, uh, I had no, I had no trouble understanding Italian. And if you speak Portuguese slowly, I can manage that too. <laughs> <laughs> Any other question? Yes, sir. What was your experience as a survivor in the United States? What was it like when you first came here? Were there any uh, other persons you met or? Discussions another, another very good and valid question. I was a fish out of water. Uh, when I arrived in the United States, uh, one of the problems was that for my grandmother, the last time she saw me after we left the concentration camp in France, I was 11. When I saw her in 1946 at 17 and a half, I was still 11 to her. So uh, don't, I want you home by 8.30 in the evening. Uh, don't go into Central Park, it's very dangerous. Beware of American girls, they have designs on you. Um, I kept hoping I would meet one of those girls. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and I found that I had, uh, well, the first American girl that I took out uh, on a date, she wanted to go on a merry-go-round. And she wanted cotton candy. And I said, oh my God, what is this? <laughs> now, I had a very hard time uh, finding someone with whom I could hold a conversation. I found the only people that I could, uh, could really converse with we're veterans from, from the Second World War, with, uh, we fought in Europe. Mm -hmm. But they didn't want to have anything to do with a 17-year-old kid. What the hell does he know? Mm -hmm. So uh, I had a great deal of trouble adapting. Uh, when I was in the Air Force, uh, I was taught by my parents, you know, you dress properly. And when we went into town, I would put on a suit and a tie and everybody thought that, oh, look at this queer, there's something wrong with this guy, okay? And I used after shaving lotion, too. Uh, I didn't know that my fellow air for, air, airmen drank this stuff. <laughs> so, uh, it was an adjusting period. Any, yes, ma'am? Um, when you were a child and you were being moved around so often, was it, was it really difficult, or was it difficult for you to comprehend the, there's this big war just happening around? Uh, Frank, I mean, to be honest, no, it's not something that I really delved on. Yes, I missed my tricycle. Uh, yes, I, uh, I missed my Tory soldiers. Yes, I missed my electric train uh, set. Uh, but um, other than that, no. And uh, I also, strangely enough, I guess I never had enough time in any one place to really form a strong bond with other kids my age. I, because I was moved so often. But the only one where I had a, a close bond relationship with, you may have seen, you may remember in the movie here, uh, I'm still here, there's one photograph where I'm standing with, uh, with a boy who's wearing long pants, and I'm wearing short pants, and uh, he was an English boy. And he was the only one that I, I think he lived very close to where I lived in the apartment, and uh, the only one that I really had a close relationship with. So, yes. How did you become involved in Holocaust education? Uh, well, uh, in the state of Florida uh, mandated the teaching of the Holocaust in 1992, mm -hmm. and the local newspaper organized a, um, a workshop for the teachers, and uh, they dug me up some, somewhere, and three others, and we uh, each told our stories to the teachers. I realized I'd better become involved. I mean, one of the first questions one teacher asked me, well, when you heard that your parents were arrested, why didn't you go to the synagogue and ask the rabbi to help you? Okay? I mean, that's like, uh, why don't you go to the police and uh, <laughs> turn yourself in? <laughs> so, that's when I realized that there really is a total lack of comprehension of what was going on. I understand living in this country, yes, if all of a sudden your parents disappear, 
And if you are in a church-going family, you would go to your church and ask your pastor whether he could help you. That, that, that's SOP here. But that certainly was not the case there. Was there much? Yes, ma'am, in the, in the back. Um, yes, sir, I, I just applaud your spirit so much. Um, many Holocaust families, the parents have not been able to talk <laughs> about their experiences. How have you dealt with it in your family so that your children learn about your experiences, but again, without the incredible pain and hurt that it caused? Thank you for raising your voice. I don't have to repeat the question. <laughs> <laughs> Very often in an audience, people whisper. And, uh, okay. Uh, the answer to that is that uh, when I came to the States, my grandmother, my uncle and aunt, uh, for instance, one of the first questions they asked me is that, uh, what do you want to be? What do you want to become? And I said, I want to get into the aircraft industry. And I was told I couldn't do that. Why not? They don't hire Jews. I'm not Jewish. I'm a Catholic. Okay? I did get into the aircraft industry. Uh, but I did not tell my children, I did not tell my daughters that I was Jewish or anything about my experience or what happened to my parents until my oldest one was uh, 18. And that's when I first talked to her about it. So I, if you will, I, I sort of lived undercover and uh, kept it hidden until then. Uh, my diaries, I... Uh, I donated to the Holocaust Museum because I came to, to the realization that uh, uh, I was mortal and uh, once I'm gone, my kids are going to go through my stuff and what's this? I don't know. Can you? I don't, can't read it. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, if it hadn't been for my donating the stuff to the, to the U.S. Holocaust Museum in Washington, I wouldn't be in Alexandra Zapruder's book. She happened to have found them there and thought that it was important enough for her uh, to, to include them in, in the diaries that she uh, published. Uh, and by the way, uh, those diaries created uh, I'm Still Here, and uh, there is a lady who uh, created a program that is particularly of interest to the uh, teachers among you here. Uh, she uh, this, uh, went to USC, uh, worked at USC uh, in Los Angeles and uh, uh, decided to compare my diaries to Anne Frank's diary. Uh, I happened to stumble on this when one fine evening I Googled myself. <laughs> <laughs> and I found out that my diary is being compared to Anne's. Are they out of their mind? I mean, my diary is so... Uh, without feeling, it is just uh, statistical data, what books I read, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I dug a little deeper. Who made this presentation? Why? I found out her name was Sheila Hansen. I dug a little deeper and discovered that she lived in, uh, I think, in North Dakota. Uh, I called her up. She nearly fell off her chair when she heard who was calling her. Anyhow. She has turned this into an interactive program, and the, the explanation she gave me is that at the, uh, the Spielberg Foundation in Los Angeles, she also came across my oral testimony, and um, she also found my diaries. And she said, gee, here we have someone where we know what he felt back in 1942-43, he wrote it down, and we have 40 years later his oral history and we see so she created a program called One Man Two Voices and she said what if Anne Frank had survived would she still 40 years later feel that notwithstanding mankind humankind is good so that's what uh, gave, gave her uh, birth to this program and by the way it's available on the internet now uh, if you just google Peter Feigl uh, one man, two voices, uh, it'll come right up. It's, uh, but I don't want to praise it, but I think it's a good program. <laughs> <coughs> we have about six more minutes. Yes? So do you identify yourself as being a member of the Jewish community, or do you more see yourself no. as a Catholic? No, I, I, I really can't. Uh, I mean, to me, Jewish, it's, it's a religion. If Sammy Davis Jr., <laughs> can convert to Judaism, okay, then it, certainly it's not a question of race. 
uh, if uh, a Christian can convert to Judaism, and I've met some, uh, it's not a, it's a, you don't suddenly leave the Christian race to become part of the Jewish race. So I, I cannot identify with that. I cannot accept that concept. Um, as far as my present beliefs are concerned, uh, I am searching. I have a real hard time, and excuse me, I know you're teaching religion, uh, I have a very hard time with organized religions. Uh, I have seen more crimes justified in the name of religion, and you don't have to go and look against uh, Jews against Muslims, you can just take Christians in Ireland, okay? Good Protestants against Catholics. And 380 some years later, they're still every orange day have to go and parade and needle them, needle them and provoke them into doing something. So I have a problem there. I have the utmost respect for Quakers. I have gone to a number of Quaker meetings. I like the notion of sitting in a circle or in a square with everyone facing one another in total silence. There is no one who proclaims to be the intermediary with God. If you think you need to speak to him, you can get up and speak. And it doesn't have to be on the subject of religion or morals or ethics. If you have something that weighs on your heart, you stand up and you talk about it. And it's catharsis. You sit down and someone else might respond and they might not. It doesn't matter. But it's an hour of introspection and uh, I admire this a great deal. I have a lot of respect for Buddhists. I mentioned I've been to 76 countries in the world. Uh, at one point, I considered becoming a Thai, uh, a Buddhist monk. Okay? I like their attitude. Uh, it says, uh, uh, Buddhists say you shouldn't play chess. But if you do, my pen right. Okay? A monk shouldn't go out with a girl. If he does, my pen right. My pen right is Thai, it means it doesn't matter. It's not that important. <laughs> it's not a, not, not a good enough reason to go to war over. So <laughs> I, I like that approach. I also like Unitarians. My wife had a professor uh, at uh, Ch Champlain College in upstate New York uh, who was a Unitarian. He was also a uh, refugee uh, from Germany, a Jewish refugee. And uh, she once asked him, uh, what do Unitarians believe? And he said to her, Unitarians believe very, very strongly in very, very little. <laughs> and you also meet the nicest Jews in the Unitarians. <laughs> now, some of you might be wondering about how I can inject levity in my story. Uh, my mother told me when I was a little kid, whenever somebody takes a picture of you, smile. It doesn't cost anything. And people like you better if you're smiling. And I have a number of pictures from the days when I was in Le Chambon and when I was in uh, Hidden in France and so forth. And uh, some of the guys that were with me at the time, why are you the only SOB who smiles in the room? You're always smiling. Mother told me to. <laughs> and the other thing is that you learned in the wartime that if you want to survive and maintain your sanity, there's something called gallows humor, okay? And gallows humor helps you get through it. I think that's it. I thank you very, very much for listening to me. Thank you very much. afternoon and just two things you know there's this this one that uh, once you hear a story it is now also your story and so it is your responsibility to take this story forward those of you who received the bags from the Holocaust Museum you know it says what you do matters <laughs>